What's up guys, Taiki here, and welcome to part three on how DeFi gets to a trillion TVL, where at the beginning of every month, I monitor DeFi trends and narratives so you can get a better gauge on what's happening and general trends within the on-chain crypto economy. So at the date of recording, according to DeFi Llama, the TVL of DeFi is at 41.79. And when I started part one, it was at 37.8. And that's a great improvement. That's a, you know, a little bit over a 10% increase, and we love to see that. However, all-time highs in TVL is at 177, basically 180. Um, and for this to happen, for you know, TVL to get from these lows to these highs, a lot of, like, a lot of things has to change. Um, and I've laid out that you know, the one way, right? There, I mean, there are many ways uh, how DeFi gets to a trolling TVL. Um, I think it has to be led mostly by stable coins. And the existential crisis that I see in DeFi is the high off-chain interest rates uh, that people can get if you're an American um, to just go to Fidelity or any other brokerage accounts, buy short-term treasuries, um, and clip, you know, let's say five to five and a quarter percent. And if people can receive the risk-free rate off-chain, then there's very little incentives for people to tr uh, convert their fiat into stable coins, bridge it on-chain, pay hefty fees expose themselves of a smart contract, rug risk, it's really not worth it, even if the rates on stable coins are, let's say, 8% on random farms with, you know, financial innovation. It really isn't. Like these, you know, DeFi native, crypto native projects just aren't good enough. Um, and I think the way um, that DeFi can slowly recover is by translating these off-chain yields on-chain. And that way, you know, we're not reliant on token inflation. We're not reliant on, you know, people paying fees and being liquidated to, you know, get like on-chain yield. Um, I think, you know, one way to create a player versus environment uh, economy, at least on-chain, is by just have these tokenized treasuries, or in other words, yield-bearing dollars, where you can take, you know, a stable coin, stake it, and earn, let's say, roughly 5%. Um, and this way, you know, we have off-chain yield sources pumping into on-chain, and that can actually create a more vibrant on-chain economy. And, you know, when I laid this thesis out, um, the TVL for real-world assets, because, you know, I mean, stable coins are real world assets. And I'm just saying that, you know what, we have non yield bearing stable coins earning 0% sitting in your wallet. Why not, you know, have, like, why not create the ability to stake those stable coins and let's say earn 5%? And at the time, you know, uh, RWA, uh, according to Defama, the TVL was 1.3 billion, as you can right. see here. Um, and now it's at 6. Point, or 6.05 billion. Of course, you know, Partly, part, part of this is because if you click to the RWA section, uh, you go to Maker. Um, in two months ago, the TVL here wasn't counted, so the three billion wasn't counted. Um, so maybe you can say that you know, uh, let's see. At, at the time, you know, maybe the TVL in RWAs was four point three billion, four point two, four point three billion, and now it's at what's it? What is it? Six point zero. I mean, that, that's pretty good, right? Uh, we went from four point three to six in the span of two months. And it's pretty simple, right? Like, would you rather earn 0% yield on stable coins or 5% yield on stable coins? It's really not a crazy thesis. Um, and I just think that the stable coin issuers are just gonna continue to suck in TVL away from USDC uh, into, you know, uh, yield bearing stable coins. And you can kind of see this in the trend here. If you go to USDC on CoinGecko and monitor the market cap, let's go here, go to max. You know, it's, it's going down, okay? Um, and interestingly, if you go to USDT, it's holding up much better. And there are a few reasons. First of all, uh, to redeem Tether into Fiat, you have to have, you know, like a good relationship with the team. Uh, you have to have like an actual account to redeem, um, you know, Tether into Fiat. So, you know, a lot of people have been um, selling Tether into USDC if they want to redeem. Um, and, you know, USDT is more stickier on chain. Uh, whereas for USDC, you know, anyone with a Coinbase account can redeem, you know, Circle for, or USDC into Fiat. Um, and all these on-chain tokenized treasuries, for example, Maker, um, what's basically happening is people are giving USDC to Maker uh, in exchange for DAI, um, and you know you can stake DAI for 5%, and in return, Maker is redeeming USDC into fiat and then buying treasuries. So it's effectively a vampire attack on USDC, and I would expect this to continue um, as long as USDC the redemption fees are zero. I think at some point um, the bleed is going to be so perf like you know so so large that uh, Coinbase and Circle they're going to be forced to you know create like a 0.05% redemption fee or something. But until that happens, I think the trend is going to continue to be down. Of course, we are seeing a broader pump in crypto prices. Um, and, I mean, it's it's down today, but you know generally, I mean, we've seen a couple big candles, um, and this is going to be also good for TVL um, because I mean if. TVL is denominated in Bitcoin and Ether and the price goes up, then yeah, the values will also be inflated. Um, 
So you can also argue that TVL is kind of like a vanity metric. Um, but if you think about DeFi, it's a financial system uh, built on top of crypto monies, Bitcoin and Ether. And if Bitcoin and Ether as crypto monies have more value, then, then there's more value for the general you know, decentralized finance ecosystem. Similar to how if the dollar has a lot of value and it's outperforming against other currencies, then the financial system in the United States will have more value than, let's say, financial you know, companies in Europe or Japan, for example. So it's a pretty simple, I mean, yeah, it's, it's kind of a similar analogy. Um, if Bitcoin pumps, if Ether continues to pump, then the financial, then DeFi as a whole should benefit. Um, and, you know, I mean, this is good to see, um, but I have been pretty disappointed in terms of like DeFi innovation. Um, and you can make an argument that we have the Uniswaps of the world. Um, you ha we have Lido, um, we have Aave, and, you know, we have an exchange, we have a staking protocol, we have a bank, um, and we have a decentralized stablecoin. Um, and that's all great and dandy. Um, and like, what more is there to be, like innovate on? And no, I mean, look, I'm, I'm not trying to like hate on this project, but there's like this new project called Prisma Finance, which is, you know, heavily hyped, at least if you go to crypto Twitter. Um, and basically what it is, is it's an over collateralized stablecoin using liquid staking derivatives as collateral. So you can, for example, take staked ETH, that's earning like 3% and then borrow against it. Um, you pay a 1% interest rate, um, but then you know you can borrow against it uh, and you get a stable coin. And if you go to the application, uh, I might need to connect my wallet, but yeah. You can borrow and then just be paid to do so with inflationary tokens. And then you know you can borrow MKUSD, which is a stable coin, stake it in here and then earn 82% APR. So it's pure inflation. I mean, you know, if you look at the actual cap table, um, if you go here, you know, it's, it's got all these angel investors. So of course, you know, all these people are going to be showing it right to their audience uh, because they're financially incentivized to do so. Um, and if you look at the token distribution, you know, 10% uh, is going to the team, 20%, sorry, 20% to the team, 10% to um, investors. And yeah, like these team tokens, there's no unlock. They're just unlock. There's, there's like no lockup period. It's unlocked linearly for 12 months. And then for the angel investors, it's also unlocked linear, linearly for 12 months. So, you know, I mean, come on, right? Like we need better things. Uh, we can't just fork existing things and then add tokens and expect to call it innovation. Yes, Prisma Finance has, you know, I mean, they, they share like the same developer community as like, you know, Curve, Convex, Frax, Conic, like whatever. Um, and, you know, you can go to prisma.convexfinance.com and you can lock up your Prisma for, you know, CVX Prisma and then you're earning, oh my God, so like such high rates. Um, but like really like, no, like th this isn't good enough, right? Um, and, you know, I, I do think that, you know, DeFi has pretty much matured in terms of new types of innovation that can happen. Um, of course, there can be innovation in terms of new stablecoin designs, um, maybe new like borrow lending designs that doesn't use oracles, maybe better even uh, decentralized exchange designs. Um, but the types of innovation happening on mainnet isn't, hasn't been that impressive. Um, and I still think that you know for more liquidity to migrate on chain, uh, we do need you know these yield earning stablecoins. And you can kind of see this, um, let's actually go here. Right, and, and I do think that, you know, like, because, I mean, the question is, uh, like, you know, most of my viewers are American, and then Americans are saying, hey, like, why would I do this, right? Why, why would I stake my uh, DAI or stake my USDT with Justin Sun when I can go to Fidelity? Well, maybe this isn't really the product for you, um, or maybe it is, um, you know. Yes, like, from a privileged American's point of view, yeah, like, I can do that. I own some TVLs myself, um, but, like, what if you're not? A privileged American, right? and you don't want to go through KYC AML um, and go through Fidelity and whatnot, then you know it's going to be more convenient for these people to, you know, convert their local currencies into uh, into the dollar, right, via stablecoins, and then stake it on chain, either on Tron, either on Mainnet, or other cheap chains, um, and earn the risk-free rate that way. And in terms of, and you know, in in exchange for that convenience, then these stablecoin issuers like Tether, um, or you know, whatever Justin Sun, um, or you know, Maker can charge a small fee and that can go towards, you know, protocol revenue um, and it's a viable business. Um, and even from my perspective, let's say I sell my coins into stable coins because I feel risk off for whatever reason um, and I want to earn the risk rate. Am I really going to go through the friction of redeeming USDC in the Coinbase, you know, 
like you know going through like a three-day withdrawal process waiting for the money to the bank and then wire the money to fidelity it takes like one day to settle um and then buy t-bills and then i have to wait like one two three months um in order for me to liquidate that position to like you know bridge off like bridge back on chain uh if i want to buy a coin after there's some correction um no i mean i mean i, I could do that but that's a lot of friction um, and maybe I'm willing to forego. Um, so instead of like earning 5.3%, maybe I'm willing to say, you know what, like let me earn 5% on DAI because you know, if I want to unstake and buy something on chain, you know, like I have the initial or I, I get rid of those frictions um, and I have instant liquidity. Um, and that's why I still think that all these tokenized treasury projects, um, whether it be, you know, Maker, Canto, Frax, um, Ondo, I mean, you, you can go through, um, let's go here. Right, you can go through here, Maker, um, you, can, you can go to Tron, Ondo Finance, Realty, Matrix Doc, Hash Note. I mean, you, you know, you can earn like roughly 5% on stablecoins. Um, and I would just expect, you know, this figure here, the one month change, just to be green across the board generally. And tangible doesn't count because it's like real estate. But, you know, I would expect this sector to be up only in TVL. And at the time, I mean, two months ago, right, um, the TVL was roughly, uh, whoops, TVL was roughly 4. Point, sorry, um, yeah, like 4.3 because it didn't count into uh, take into account Maker, um, and now it's at six. Okay, so I would expect maybe by January that this number will be at seven or something, right? Um, like what? Like, you know, like it, this is purely a market inefficiency in my opinion. Uh, all this, you know, this like like USDC that's like sitting there doing nothing. Like this should just be converted into. Um, either fiat to go into T bills or yield bearing stable coins on chain. Um, and this is like one of like the bigger macro trends that I foresee happening in the future. Um, but you know, we'll, uh, you know, o o only time will tell. Um, I guess we'll talk about price a little bit just because um, Maker has been underperforming and it is my largest holding right now. Um, and like, I, I guess in my defense, I purchased it in July. Um, and, you know, Maker, even in this correction, is up, you know, 35%. Or like like thirty percent, let's say, um, and Bitcoin since July, like middle of July is like up you know, fifteen percent. So you know Maker has outperformed, and Ether since July is is down, right? It's down. So Maker has outperformed, but you know this recent underperformance when the markets are pumping and it's going right down uh, is kind of concerning, right? The Maker ETH ratio. I was screaming for Maker to get the parity, um, and then now it's down. <laughs> what is it like? It's it's down like. It's down like 25%. So it's definitely not ideal. Um, but this is like what I've been saying, right? Like Maker is a very defensive asset. So if the markets are rather risk off or it's choppy or no one really knows what the future direction of the markets are, then I think more and more money is going to flow into Maker because it's one of the few assets that um, is actually making a bunch of money and a lot of money is uh, flowing into buybacks. So the buybacks have stopped uh, because the system surplus is below 50 million. Um, but I would expect more money to flow on chain, right? I mean, you know, every couple of weeks, every couple of months, uh, all these, all this money flows on chain, and then you know they're used to buy back the token. Um, you know, it's it stopped for quite some time now. The last buyback was I don't even know, like a couple days ago. Um, it, 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 okay, like a few days ago. It's, it doesn't even show here. Um, and then you know I, I've also talked about okay, like the maker PE ratio is like fourteen. It's so cheap. Um, but you know, like do do crypto people who really care about PE ratios? I think at some point. As markets become more efficient, they will. Um, but like maybe, right? Like maybe literally people have made money on Maker, and you know because they've outperformed, they're buying, they're rotating Maker, right? Selling Maker to buy more volatile crypto assets, um, and maybe that that's literally what's happening here, right? A capital rotation away from Maker into more higher risk assets, um, which I mean I'm not really against, right? I mean that's how people should do it. Uh, my entire approach for Maker has been, yeah, like let's just outperform Bitcoin, let's outperform Ether by holding maker um, and once more risk on signals you know start to show in the markets like you know rotate right maybe i'm being too stubborn um by just still holding on the maker maybe that rotation has already happened um but i still think that you know if you look at my youtube metrics um i've still yet to gain subscribers right i mean this is pretty pretty sad uh, maybe this is a me problem and not like a broader crypto <laughs> crypto problem um but i you know like this is like a common trend i noticed for other cri crypto channels um that are you know like on the larger side um so there's some stagnation there um and if you look at you know for example 
total market cap, this contains, yeah, I mean, everything, everything, right? Bitcoin, Ether, stablecoins, altcoins, and it's putting in new local highs, whereas total two, which doesn't contain Bitcoin, is you know still relatively flat, and then total three is still relatively flat. Um, so this kind of tells me that there isn't new money entering the space. Um, of course, I'm, I, obviously, right? Some institutions are buying Bitcoin, some retail has started to buy Bitcoin, other altcoins, um, but it might be just offset by people you know still leaving, um, and until you know we see just like you know total three just like pump out of the wazoo, uh, and total two pump out of the wazoo. Um, I don't really see crazy alt season happening. I could be wrong. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's all according to your risk tolerance, right? Uh, maybe I'm more conservative and I'm not going to just like go crazy aping YOLO, um, you know, leverage altcoins until, you know, uh, this gets to local highs. Um, but, you know, that, that also means that if I'm waiting for confirmation, then I'll be buying crypto at higher prices on average. Um but you know, maybe you can argue that it's less risk. Um, and if you're more on the higher risk uh, spectrum, then maybe you're like, okay, like this is the bottom. I'm, I, I expect it to go higher. So instead of waiting for Boomer Taiki to buy uh, or rotate his maker, I'm gonna just you know buy Solana or something. Uh, so let's talk about Solana. Solana is very interesting. Um, so I, I do another podcast called Steady Lads, and we've talked extensively about you know, Solana value accrual, um, the problems with Solana, um, mostly because, you know, um, FTX owns over a billion dollars with the Solana that has to be liquidated over like the next four years um, or four to five years. And look, I, I have no idea when that, like when all that supply is going to hit the markets, but it's, it's, it's kind of hard for me to psychologically buy this thing, knowing that there's a forced seller. Um, and as Solana goes to higher and higher prices, it's also going to increase the dollar value of Solana. Um, so, if there's a billion dollars with the Solana that has to be liquidated at $40, then, you know, even if the the units of tokens don't change, you know, uh, at $80, it's going to be $2 billion. So the market has to absorb more um, supply via like USD purchases, which I mean, it could, right? And, you know, I'm, you know, like, I'm not saying that I'm right, um, but Solana as an asset is less interesting to me. Maybe I'm like purely coping. Um, but I do want to talk about the DeFi ecosystem um, because you know DeFi isn't just Ethereum, L2 is mainnet. Um, it's also other all all one ecosystems. And I talked about Kanto, um, and I you know I'll do the weekly updates tomorrow or you know this weekend. Um, but I do want to talk about the Solana ecosystem because I do think some interesting things are happening here. Um, so one thing, for example, is there's this new airdrop for the Pit network. And if you've used any applications that used the price oracle in the past, you're eligible for an airdrop. So um, I got a few thousand tokens um, because I've used, you know, like DeFi applications. Um, and if you actually look here um, about the airdrop, you know, PIT token is the SPL, like it uses the SPL standard, meaning it's native to the Solana blockchain. Meaning that, you know, for me, if I wanted to claim my PIT airdrop, by the way, I, I, I don't know when, it's, like, when exactly it's happening. Um, they just took the snapshot and, you know, you can check um, on the website. Uh, so I'll put it in the description. Um, so, you know, there's going to be probably thousands of people. I, I don't know the exact amount, but you know, thousands and ten thousands of like wallets that needs to claim these tokens. And, you know, in order to claim, I need to create a Solana wallet. So I haven't touched my Phantom wallet in probably like over a year, to be honest. Uh, but now I'm like, okay, like, I guess I have to re-download it. I have to you know, find my private keys and like, do, do all that stuff. Um, and I think this is like one of the catalysts, right? Um, so this acts as a stimulus check for the on-chain economy. And also, it's not just a stimulus check. People have to download or you know, people have to you know, get some Solana wallet to claim. And I think that alone is a catalyst. Um, and we've also started to see other types of projects like Jupiter, which is an aggregator, um, you know, promise an airdrop. Um, I don't really think this airdrop is going to be worth that much, um, but, you know, it's something. Um, and we've also seen this trend where, uh, not Tether, but Celestia, they recently did an airdrop, um, you know, and fortunately, right, very fortunately, um, Gary Gensler was able to protect me from this airdrop. So, you know, I'm, I'm very, I'm, I'm very protected from potential uh, financial losses of getting free tokens. Um, but, you know, I mean, you know, we start to see like more teams do these airdrops. And, you know, like, as, as I talked about, I think more and more teams are going to be incentivized to drop tokens if they believe that, you know, 2024 is going to be a good year. Why? Well, most, I mean, if you look at most tokenomics, uh, for team and investors, they have a one-year lockup, right? So if they drop a token, let's say today, 
um, the tokens will start to vest for team and investors um, on November 2nd, 2024. And they, they usually have like a three year unlock period, right? Um, so if people think that 2024 and 2025 is going to be a good year for crypto, um, then t the team and investors, they have to plan for that, right? Like they want their tokens to start unlocking when, you know, euphoria is in the air. So there's liquidity for them to dump into. Um, so, I mean, obviously like the, the things I'm saying, right? It's like, you know, like VC tokens, like team tokens. Um, but if like from like an airdrop perspective, um, it could, right, catalyze uh, like, a, like a substantial wealth effect if people are just getting stimulus checks on chain. And who are gonna be receiving these stimulus checks? It's gonna be people like you and I that's pers like that's persevered throughout this bear market and continued to use the chain. Um, so, you know, I mean, that could also help catalyze like a potential ETH BTC bottom. Um, and, you know, like I, I don't really have a good view on this and I don't really care about the ETH BTC ratio if I were to be completely honest. Um, but if people get airdrops, you know, those people tend to be crypto natives and crypto natives tend to denominate their wealth in ETH. So all these airdrops, people are more likely going to be selling it into Ether than, let's say, Bitcoin. Um, so that could also potentially lead to, you know, an ETH BTC bottom slowly but surely. Um, but, you know, it's it's just speculation, right? Um, but, yeah, I think that's going to be mostly it for me. Um, I think I want to talk about some, something else. Um, okay, we're 21 minutes in. Uh, if you're watching this video, um, you're going to watch it till the end. So let me, so give me like 20 seconds for me to think about what I missed. Um, Oh yeah, okay. I, I remember that. Okay, so back. To, <laughs> okay, that, back to my thread, right? Um, so basically, you know, I basically declared the be the beginning of the bull market a couple months ago, um, just because I see this trend happening, where the problem within DeFi is lack of on-chain yields, and we can fix that by tokenizing treasuries and creating yield-bearing dollars. And you know, and if you also think about, you know, like where are institutions going to allocate their money into? Sure, they're going to allocate to Bitcoin, right, via the ETF, and maybe the ETH ETF next. Um, but if you think about altcoins, yeah, like they're probably going to allocate to like maybe Solana or like layer ones. Um, but from like a sector perspective, I think there's also going to be a significant amount of capital that's going to go into tokenization of securities, right? Um, I mean, that's what you know, Larry Fink's been talking about for years, um, or maybe not years, maybe months. Um, and I do think that the real world asset sector is going to be the main benefactor. Um, and maybe it's not like an exciting sector, right? It's like, yes, yield on stable coins. You know, from like, from like a DGEN perspective, who gives a fuck, right? Um, however, you know, I do think that this has to happen in order for the on-chain economy to slowly recover. Uh, because, for example, if you look at, you know, the costs. So there's $1.6 billion uh, of stake to die, earning 5%. And the cost to the protocol is $80 million. Um, but that also means that in the next year, assuming that this value stays constant, which I don't think it will, um, there's $80 million worth of value coming from government instruments into the hands of crypto degens like you and I. And this is another form of the wealth effect, okay? Like, if you think about on-chain yields, right, people are farming and dumping Prisma tokens to, you know, <laughs> like, you know, like, you know make yield um, and it's coming at the expense of people that buy Prisma tokens for whatever reason. Um, or if you go to perp platforms like GMX or something, if you LP, you make money when you know people pay fees when they get, li when they get liquidated. Um, that's negative sum games and I'm arguing um, that you know these things are creating positive sum games um, because you know just one way flows off chain to on chain um, and though that might not be reflected in you know, I mean, you, you can't really see this, right? Like, oh my God, like so much money is coming on chain. That is why Bitcoin is pumping. I mean, probably not, okay? Um, it's morally, more likely due to the ETF. Is it because, but I mean, you know, like there's like no way to say that, you know, tokenized treasuries are leading to this Bitcoin, Ether, crypto overall pump um, because there's no way for me to prove it. However, I'm just saying that bec like, if we adopt this, and if more USDC gets redeemed for, you know, these on-chain like tokenized treasuries, it makes it more likely or it helps support higher valuations because we do have an actual form of yield that people benefit from. And if the crypto economy is denominated in USD, it's a very dollarized economy. If you think about it, 
um, then any form of dollar yields that are sustainable and scalable is going to be pretty good um, for the general DeFi ecosystem. And that's the argument that I've been making. Um, you don't have to agree with me with like my maker thesis or like my candle thesis, um, you know, because like, I could be wrong, right? I mean, I, I literally could be wrong. Um, but I think it's more of like this macro narrative that I want you to be aware of. Um, and, you know, that's kind of the point of this entire channel, right? Um, I'm like just trying to come up with ideas um, that might that may or may not make sense. Um, I have my mix of good calls and horrible calls. Um, but, you know, I try to share my research in public in real time so you can get a better idea of where I am at um, in terms of like my headspace. Um, and hopefully this video was useful. Um, and I'll see you next month for part four on how DeFi gets to a trillion TVL. Thank you for watching um, and see you guys another time. Bye-bye.